sent out a group text message this morning. Now, Jen and April both, they got them as, they got this text message as a, as a single text message. Even though I have everyone as a group, for some reason it's not sending the text message as a group. It's sending individually. So, anyway, I'm going to try to figure that out. I'm going to try to see why that is the case. Technology nowadays is, gives me a headache, so I'll do my best. just want to let you know. Okay. All of us have come together this evening to remember a very important day. It was 2,000 years ago, Jesus' death on the cross. This day is the day that God, in his foreknowledge, determined would come to pass. We come together today as one in Christ, a family in Christ, people who are saved, who are sanctified, who are justified by the grace of God, for the specific purpose to remember Jesus and his death. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we read the following, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now understand, Jesus made a choice. He made a choice here. And the choice that he made was to leave the very presence of God, the very presence of his Father, to come to this world to live in a human body just as you and I have, are doing, and to serve us, to serve all of us, to serve all of mankind by giving us his time, his energy, his love, his patience, and most importantly, what we needed the most, the forgiveness of sin, through his death on the cross. In John chapter 6, verse 38, we also read the following. Jesus said, for I have come down from heaven not do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus' mission during his earthly life was to do the will of his Father. That was his mission. And one of the most important aspects of doing the will of his Father was you can find in John 1, 29, where John the Baptist says concerning Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now also in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 to 22, we read the following. Therefore, he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, because a death has taken place for the redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Where a will exists, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will is valid... Only when people die, since it is never enforced while the one who made it is living. That is why even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when every command had been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God has commanded for you. In the same way. He sprinkled the tabernacle and all the articles of worship with the blood. According to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. Take note, this very important part. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This couldn't just be anyone's blood. I mean, the Old Testament, just in general. This could not just be anyone's blood. This blood had to come from, a, from an unblemished, innocent, perfect body. And this is where Jesus comes in. This is where Jesus comes in. Jesus is our mediator. He's our middleman. And he's our lifeline between us and God. Without Jesus, really focus in on this. With, without him, without Jesus, there is absolutely no hope for a future with God. Period. Without Jesus becoming the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, all of us would be doomed. But thanks be to God, that's not the case for all of us here today. Because without the shedding of blood, there are no, there is no forgiveness. Period. And He is the one that shed His blood for all of us. We also read in Mark chapter fourteen, verse thirty-two to thirty-six, the following. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying to His Father. He said, "Well, then, it says then they came to a place called Gethsemane, and He told His disciples, sit here while I pray.'" He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. 
He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. He went a little farther, fell to the ground, and prayed that if it were possible. He prayed that if it were possible, yeah. that the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Even though Jesus, Jesus in reality, he didn't want to suffer through this death. If he didn't have to, who would? Who would want to die for the sins of Number one, for the sins of people. Number two, you didn't even commit those sins yourself. And the death that he knew that he was about to die, the, the, the process of the death he was about to face under the Roman government. This was a serious um, punishment, an excruciating death that people went through. But even though Jesus didn't want to suffer through this death, he knew it was coming. And he was willing to do it, even if it was not what he wanted to do. He said, not my will, but your will be done. And this goes back to Jesus' mission on this earth, being to do his Father's will. Thankfully, Jesus allowed himself as an innocent man to be scourged and flogged to the very point of death by sinful men. Now, I want to talk about that moment. I want to talk about the moment that Jesus was flogged and scourged. And it's going to get a little graphic. Because... I think it is important that we understand how, how, how graphic a death like this was. I'm sure many of us have seen the Passion of Christ. So you get a little bit of that. Um, and that's exactly, it's a good picture of how it really was, but it was much worse um, what the Roman Empire used to do to people. Under the Roman Empire, prepping a person to be condemned to death by the way of crucifixion it's been said that the Romans would typically strip the person naked, bind him to a lower pillar so that he could bend over it, or chain him to an upright pillar to be stretched out. After that, two Roman soldiers would then take a whip, and this whip they, they gave the nickname called the Cat of Nine Tails. And they would beat the criminal over and over and over again with this. And according to Wikipedia, there was no limit there was no limit to the number of blows that a person would be inflicted with. This was left to the soldiers to decide um, how many blows they wanted to get the individual. This was left to them to make that decision. But they weren't supposed to kill the person. They, they, were, they, they were to beat the person severely, but they were not supposed to kill the person. This was left for the Roman soldiers to decide. Now this whip... If you're wondering what did this whip look like, this whip consisted of a rope with metal balls, bones, and metal spikes, of which has been said could easily cause disfigurement and serious trauma, such as ripping pieces of the flesh from the body or loss of an eye. So Jesus, innocent, righteous, holy, almighty, went through this for us. He didn't have to. He didn't have to do any of that. He really didn't. And if that wasn't already bad enough, Suffering that before crucifixion, going through that before crucifixion, right after that, he was made to carry his own cross up a hill of which he was to be nailed to. Nailed to a cross he was for our transgressions, for our sins, for my sins, for your sins. That is why Jesus died. That is why he died. Because he knew that without his death, we had no hope. Period. God knew that we couldn't do it. And there was a legal justification that had to happen. Some, some, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God is righteous, he is holy, he is just. Someone has to pay for sin, and it has to be a perfect sacrifice. And that is the reason Jesus could only do it. He died for our sins, all, remember, all because he sought to do the Father's will. I have not come down from heaven to do my will, but to do my will. John 15, verse 13, we're told, No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay his life down for his friend. That's exactly what he did for us. So this leads me to my conclusion. It's going to be a short minute. And, well, actually the conclusion is that the last piece of paper in your packet. I want, you, I want you guys to be able to take this home with you. Just to remember three things. I could have given you a list of ten, but I didn't want to exhaust you. Three things. Because of Jesus' death, 
we have the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, the Apostle Paul says this, And when you were dead in tra your trespasses and in the circumcision of your flesh, he made you, he made Philadelphia Congregational Christian Church alive with him and forgave them of all their trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that were against them and opposed to them and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Everything that we owe God, all the debt that we owe God, sin is looked at as a debt. Our sin was a debt that we owe back to God. We had to pay it. He paid it for us. He took all the stuff that was against us spiritually, legally, before God, and he nailed it to the cross. Also, because of Jesus' death, we have been justified. This is a legal declaration before God. We are forgiven, justified, made right before God's sight. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we're told, Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by His blood. Remember, without blood there's no forgiveness. Remember that. Since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through we will be saved through him from wrath, God's wrath. And lastly, the third thing, because of Jesus' death, we understand that God really does love us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God proves his own love for us, that and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm glad God does he just doesn't talk the talk. He walks the walk. And he lets you know that he really loves you. He lets us know that he really loves us. And in the moment, I'm going to say it because Christians tend to think this way. The moment when you think he's left you, he says, shut up. I've never left you. I'll never forsake you or leave you. You are my child. I love you and I'm with you regardless of your flaws, regardless of the mistakes you make. He looks at us through the lens of the blood of Christ. He knows it. I made mistakes as a child, I, and, but nonetheless, my parents still love me. The same thing with God. He knows we're going to make mistakes. My kids make mistakes, but that doesn't take away the fact that we love each other. So this leads me to the Lord's Supper. So now, as I already said, what we're about to do is very serious. This whole this whole occasion. But right here, what we're about to do is very serious. It's a memorial, as I've already said, and an ordinance that Christ has set up for his people to participate in. And while we take the Lord's Supper, let us remember the flogging, the details. Remember the in intense details. I encourage you to go home and look more up on this. I have I have read articles of a, of a doctor's um, explanation. I, could, I thought about reading that, but it, it was a long article. But they go with in detail on what happens to a person's body when they're on a cross. I encourage you to really read that. It's graphic. But to understand that Jesus went through that. He went through that for you and me. While we take the Lord's Supper, let us remember the flogging, the scourging, and the Roman crucifixion that Jesus went through for all of us here. Now, this Sunday, I'm not going to be speaking on 1 Corinthians 5. I'm going to be speaking on the resurrection. I think it's good to find out the benefits of the death of Christ, but it's even better to find out the benefits of the resurrection. So, look forward to speaking about that. Prepare your mind for Action Sunday, because we're going to open up God's Word to see what He has to say about that. So let us pray, and then we will partake of the Lord's Supper. Lord, thank you for the time we're able to partake in this memorial, this ordinance that you have set up. We take these things today, God, and we remember you. We remember your flogging, your scourging, and the details of what it was to go through a Roman crucifixion to be pre prepared to die on a cross. Help us to come to you with humility, to let everything that we came in here with, if we came in here today with anxieties, with sin, regardless of whatever it is, help us to lay them at your feet and to trust in you and to live for you as we leave this building. Help us to focus on Christ and his death, remembering that none of us are worthy of his death, but nonetheless you love us anyways, and you gave us him to die in our place. Help us to focus on him, his body, as we as we partake of the bread, as we eat the bread, we, we 
who remember his body that was scourged, beaten, flesh torn, who remember that. And as we drink the juice, help us remember his blood. That juice represents the very blood that forgives all of our sins. Past, present, future, Lord, all because of Christ. Help us to remember that. Hold on to that, cherish that, and spread that to those around us, to our family, to our friends, to our children. We just thank you for this time we've been able to gather together again today. Be with us as we partake of this Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name. One of these days, I'm hoping that makes it much easier. 
drives me nuts. But I have noticed if you, maybe you guys already know how to open them very well, but I'm struggling up here. If you take the if you take the corner piece and you kind of twist it, it lifts that purple one. This is for Peter. Okay, he's got. A, is that an eye? The box cutter. Okay. Will you just bring it up? Do what you gotta do. Just don't show Jeremiah. Like I said, it's been great meeting with you guys today. I look forward to meeting Sunday, Lord willing, if He blesses us to have help to come here. And, uh, Lord willing. Uh, so be safe going home. I hear it's going to freeze again tonight. It's crazy. We had snow the other day. I don't know if your mind was blown like mine was. Uh, I went to work and there wasn't no snow. Got off in the morning, there was snow everywhere. And, no, and normally I get notifications on my phone. I got the Fox 59 weather app. And they've been slapping here lately. They haven't been letting me know. So, uh, like I said, it's a great meeting with you guys. And I'll say one more quick prayer, and we'll see each other Sunday. Lord, thank you for the time again that we've been able to come together. So thankful for your death, and most importantly, your resurrection. Or Christianity, our faith, hinges on resurrection. The resurrection is what matters. The death of Christ is what matters. But the resurrection, that's what matters. Be with us as we leave and go to our homes. Please keep us safe. Please be with our friends and our families, Lord. Please be with those who can't be here today. Please be with Lynn and uh, Diane. I know Diane is not feeling well today. She told me, so please be with her. Please be with her. Please be with the staff or family. Please be with all, all of us, Lord, all of us who have lost loved ones. Please give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Please be with us. Please help us to get through hard times. Please uphold us in times where it's easy to want to fall and give up. Please be with us. We know you will. 